when Samuel denounced Saul's first great sin and announced that his kingdom should not continue. He declared the Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. 1 Samuel 13, verse 14. To this allusion was made by the Apostle Paul in his address in the synagogue at Antioch. He raised up to them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony, and said, I have found David the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Acts 13, verse 22. A truly wondrous tribute was this to the character of David, yet one which the general course of his life did bore out. The dominant characteristics of our patriarch was his unfeigned and unsurpassed devotion to God, his cause and his word. Blessedly is this illustrated in what is now to be before us. The man after God's own heart is the one who is out and out for him putting his honor and glory before all other considerations. 1 Samuel 17, verse 15 supplies a precious link between what was considered in our last lesson and what we are now about to ponder. There we are told, But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem, knowing that he was to be the next king over Israel. Natural prudence would suggest that his best policy was to remain at court making the most of his opportunities and seeking to gain the goodwill of the ministers of state. But instead of doing so, the son of Jesse returned to the sheepfold, leaving it with God to work out his will concerning him. No seeker after self-aggrandizement was David. The palace, as such, possessed no attractions for him. Having fulfilled his service to the king, he now returns to his father's farm. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shotko. 1 Samuel 17, verse 1. Josephus says that this occurred not long after the things related in the preceding chapter had transpired. It seems likely that the Philistines had heard of Samuel's forsaken of Saul and of the king's melancholy and distraction occasioned by the evil spirit and deemed it a suitable time to avenge themselves upon Israel for their last slaughter of them. The enemies of God's people are ever alert to take advantage of their opportunities, and never have they a better one than when their leaders provoke God's spirit and his prophets leave them. Nevertheless, it is blessed to see here how that God makes the wrath of man to praise him. Psalm 76 verse 10. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah, set to battle in array against the Philistines. Chapter 17, verse 2. The king had been relieved, for a season at least, of the evil spirit. But the spirit of the Lord had not returned to him, as the sequel plainly evidences. A sorry figure did Saul and his forces now cut, and there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath. And he stood and cried to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am I not a Philistine, and your servants, to Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Verse 4 and verses 8 to 11. Ere pondering the haughty challenge which was here thrown down, let us point out for the strengthening of faith and the inerrancy of holy writ a small detail which exhibits a minute accuracy and harmony of the word. In number 13, we read that the spies sent out by Moses to inspect the promised land declared, The land through which we have gone to search it is the land that eats up the inhabitants of it. And all the people that we saw in it are men of a great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, verses 32 and 33. Now I'll link this up with Joshua 11, verses 21 and 22. And at that time came Joshua and cut off the Anakims from the mountains. There was none of the Anakims left in the land of the children of Israel, only in Gaza. 
in Gath, and in Ashdod there remained. Here in our present passage, it is stated, quite incidentally, that Goliath belonged to Gath. Thus, Moses, Joshua, and Samuel is a word established, concurring as they do in a manner quite artless to verify a single, particular. How jealous was God about his word! What a sure foundation faith has to rest upon! Goliath pictures to us the great enemy of God and man, the devil seeking to terrify and bring into captivity those who bear the name of the Lord. His prodigious size, probably over eleven feet, symbolize the great power of Satan. His accoutrements, compare the word armor in Luke 11 verse 22, figure the fact that the resource of flesh and blood cannot overcome Satan. His blatant challenge adumbrated the roaring of the lion. Our great adversary, as he goes about seeking whom he may devour. First Peter 5, verse 8. His declaration that the Israelites were but servants to Saul, verse 8, was only too true. For they were no longer in subjection to the Lord, First Samuel 8, verse 7. The dismay of Saul, verse 11, is in solemn contrast to his boldness in 11, verses 5 to 11, and chapter 14, verse 47. When the Spirit of the Lord was upon him then, the terror of the people, verse 11, was a sad evidence of the fact that the fear of the Lord was no longer upon them. But all of this only served to provide a background upon which the courage of the man after God's own heart might more evidently appear. The terrible giant of Gath continued to menace the army of Israel twice a day for no less than forty days a period which in Scripture is ever associated with probation and testing. Such a protracted season served to make the more manifest the impotency of a people out of communion with God. There was Saul himself, who from his shoulders and upward was higher than any of the people. Chapter 9, verse 2. There was Jonathan, who assisted only by his armor-bearer, had on former occasions slain twenty of the Philistines. Chapter 14, verse 14, there was Abner, the captain of the host, a valiant man, but he too declined Goliath's challenge. Ah, oh, my reader, the best, the bravest of men, are no more than what God makes them. When he renews not his courage, the stoutest heart is a coward, yet God does not act arbitrarily. Rather, his cowardice one of the consequences of lost communion with him. The righteous are bold as a lion. Proverbs 28, verse 1. Man's extremity is God's opportunity, but he does not always nor generally act immediately when we are brought low. No, he waits to be gracious. Isaiah 30, verse 18 that our helplessness may be the more fully realized, that his delivering hand may be seen the more clearly, and that his merciful interposition may be the more appreciated. But even at this time, when all seemed lost to Israel, when there was none in her army that dared to pick up the gauntlet which Goliath had thrown down, God had his man in reserve, and in due time he appeared on the scene and vindicated the glorious name of Jehovah. The instrument chosen seemed, to natural wisdom and military prudence, a weak and foolish one, utterly unfitted for the work before him. Ah, it is just such that God uses. And why? That the honor may be his, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Before considering the grand victory which the Lord wrought through David, let us carefully ponder the training which he had reserved in the school of God. This is deeply important for our heart. It was away from the crowd, in the quietude of pastoral life, that David was taught the wondrous resources which there are in God available to faith. There, in the fields of Bethlehem, he had by divine enablement slain the lion and the bear. This is ever God's way. He teaches in secret that soul which he has elected shall serve him in public. Oh, my reader, is this not just at this point that we may discover the explanation of our failures? It is because we have not sufficiently cultivated the secret place of the Most High, Psalm 91, verse 1. That is our primary need. 
But do we really esteem communion with God our highest privilege? Do we realize that walking with God is the source of our strength? There had been direct dealings between David's soul and God out there in the solitude of the fields. And it is only thus that any of us are taught how to get to victory. Have you yet learned, my brother or sister, that the closet is a great battlefield of faith? It is the genuine denying of self, the daily taking up of the cross, the knowing how to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and the bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Second Corinthians 10 verse 5 let the foe be met and conquered in private, and we shall not have to mourn defeat when we meet him in public. Oh, may the Holy Spirit impress deeply upon each of our heart the vital importance of coming forth from the presence of God as we enter upon any service to him. This it is which regulates the difference between success and failure. Note how the Blessed Redeemer acted on this principle, Luke 6, verse 12 and 13. And Jesse said to David his son, Take now for your brethren an ephah of this parched horn, and these ten loaves, and run to the camp to your brethren, and carry these ten cheeses to the captain of their thousand. And look how your brethren fare, and take their pledge. Verses 17 and 18. Another beautiful type is this of our Savior's going about his father's business, seeking the good of his brethren. A similar one is found in Genesis 37, 13, and 14. But without staying to develop this thought, let us observe how God was directing all things to the accomplishment of his purpose. Jesse had eight sons, and only three of them had joined Saul's army, so that five of them were at home. David, the youngest, was the one sent, though Jesse knew it not. God had worked for him to do. Nothing happens by chance in this world. All is controlled and directed from on high. John 19, verse 11. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper, hook, and went, as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as a host was going forth to the fight, shouted for the battle. Verse 20. How this evidence, the readiness and eagerness of David to obey his father's orders. Again, we may look from the type to the anti-type and hear him say, Lo, I come to do your will, O God. Hebrews 10, verse 7. Blessed is it to Mark that David was as mindful of his father's sheep as he was of his commands. His leaving them with a keeper evidenced his care and fidelity in the discharge of his office. His faithfulness in a few things fitted him to be ruler over many things. He who is best qualified to command is the one who had previously learned to obey. God's providence brought him to the camp very seasonably, when both sides had set to battle in array, and as it should seem, were more likely to come to an engagement than they had yet been all the forty days. Both sides were now preparing to fight. Jesse little thought of sending his son to the army just in that critical juncture, but the wise God orders the time and all the circumstances of actions and affairs, so as to serve his design of securing the interests of Israel and advancing a man after his own heart, in quote, Matthew Henry. Though he had only just completed a long journey, we are told that David ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren, verse 22. This reminds us of Proverbs 22, verse 29. Seest thou a man diligent in business? He shall stand before kings. As David talked with his brethren, Goliath came forth again and repeated his challenge. The whole army was sore afraid. Verse 24. And though reminding one another of the promised reward awaiting the one who slew the giant, none dared venture his life. Such inducements as Saul offered sink into utter insignificance when death confronts a man. David mildly expostulated with those who stood near him, pointing out that Goliath was defying the armies of the living God. Verse 26. And Eliab, the eldest brother, heard when he spake to the men. Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why did you come here? And with whom... Have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? 
I know your pride, and the naughtiness of your own heart, for you are come down that you might see the battle. Verse 28. How this reminds us of what is said of David's son and Lord in John 1, verse 11, and so on. There is a lesson here which every true minister of Christ does well to take to heart. For by so doing, he will be forearmed against many a disappointment and discouragement, sufficient for the disciple to be as his master. If the incarnate Son was not appreciated, his agents should not expect to be. For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Galatians 1 verse 10. Not only will men in general be displeased, but even the people of God, when in a low state, will neither understand nor value the actings of faith. The men of God must be prepared to be misinterpreted and to stand alone. Blessed is it to Mark, David's reply to the cruel taunt of his brother. It was a real testing of his meekness. But when he was reviled, he reviled not again. Nor did he attempt any self-indication or explanation of his conduct. Such had been quite wasted upon one with such a spirit. First, he simply asked, What have I done? What fault have I committed to be thus chided? Reminding us of our Lord's meek reply under a much stronger provocation, Why do you smite me? John 18, verse 23. Second, he said, Is there not a cause? This he left with him. There was a cause for his coming to the camp. His father had sent him. The honor of Israel, sullied by Goliath, required it. The glory of God necessitated it. Third, he turned from him toward another, verse 30. David speaking to one and another soon reached the ears of Saul, who accordingly sent for him. To the king he at once said, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine, only to be met with this reply. Are you not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him? Ah, these that undertake great and public services must not think it strange if they be discountenanced and opposed by those from whom they have reason to expect support and assistance, but must humbly go on with their work in the face not only of their enemy threat, but of their friends' slights and suspicions, in quote, Matthew Henry. The language used by him in the presence of the king was not the bravado of a boaster, God-honoring testimony of a man of faith. Saul and his people were in despair, as a consequence of their being occupied with the things of sight. The man of faith had a contemptuous disdain for Goliath, because he viewed him from God's viewpoint as his enemy, and his uncircumcised. Note how he attributed his previous successes to the Lord, and how he improved them to count upon him for further victory. See verse 37. The response made by Saul to David's pleading was solemnly ludicrous. First, he said, Go, and the Lord be with you, which were idle words on such lips. Next, we read that Saul armed David with his own armor, i.e., with some that he kept in his armory, in which he had far more confidence than in God. But David quickly perceived that such was unsuited to him. The one who has much to do with God in secret cannot employ worldly means and methods in public. The man of faith has no use for carnal weapons, such things as ecclesiastical titles, dress, ritualistic ceremonies, which are imposing to the eye of the natural man, are but bubbles and bubbles to the spiritual. And David put them off him, verse 39, and advanced to meet the haughty Philistine with only a sling and five smooth stones. Should it be asked, but are we not justified in using means? The answer is yes. The means which God supplies, the smooth stones, but not which man offers, his armor. When the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, verse 42. First Eliab had taunted, then Saul had sought to discourage, and now Goliath scorns him. Ah, the one who by grace is walking by faith must not expect to be popular with men, for they have no capacity to appreciate that which actuates him. 
But true faith is neither chilled by a cold reception nor cooled by outward difficulties. It looks away from both to him with whom it has to do. If God is for us, Romans 8, 31, it matters not who is against us. Nevertheless, faith has to be tested to prove its genuineness, to strengthen its fiber, to give occasion for its exercise. Well, may writer and reader pray, Lord, increase our faith. The Philistine blustered, cursed David by his gods, verse 43, and vowed he would give his flesh to the fowls and the beasts. But it is written, the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, Ecclesiastes 9, verse 11. And again, God resists the proud, James 4, verse 6. The response made by David at once revealed the secret of his confidence, the source of his strength, and the certainty of his victory. I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Ah, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs into it and is safe. Proverbs 18, verse 10. The reader is so familiar with the blessed sequel that little comment on it is required. Faith, having brought God into the scene, could announce a victory in advance. Verse 46. One stone in his hand was worth more than all of the Philistines' armor on the giant of unbelief. And why? Because that stone, though flung by David's sling, was directed and made efficacious by the hand of God. It is pitiable to find how some of the best commentators missed a real point here. Verse 6 begins the description of Goliath's armor by saying he had a helmet of brass upon his head. Some have suggested this fell off and he lifted up his hand to curse David by his gods. Verse 43. Others suppose he left a visor open that he might see the better. But David's stone did not enter his eye, but his forehead. Divine power sent it through the helmet of brass. In David's cutting off his head, verse 51, we have a foreshadowment of what is recorded in Hebrews 2, verse 14. 